So the first I want to talk about is economic incentives. And I'm going to talk about that in the setting of vaccination. So one pretty standard uh, uh, policy for reducing diseases, in particular in poor countries, is to get people vaccinated. Now, and this is actually one of the research areas where, where the research group that got the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, uh, yesterday or, or two days before they uh, got the prize for. They were looking at how can we get poor people to increase the uptake of vaccination in vaccination programs. And one of their key findings was that, well, in, by rewarding households to, to vaccinate, so not only provide, even if you would provide vaccination for free, we would know that a number of people would not take the vaccine. But by introducing very small incentives for vaccination, we can see a pretty big increase in uptakes of vaccination uh, in these programs. And the reason why we want to do that is that these vaccinations will provide a positive externality. It will reduce the, uh, the, the extent of the diseases, which will mean that it will reduce the use of antibiotics. So there are sort of two positive externalities of having a vaccination. People will be sick, fewer people will be sick, and there will be less use of antibiotics. The second uh, is looking at agriculture. So how can we reduce the use of antibiotics in agriculture? And I'm going to talk about two different solutions here. The first one is what I talked about, that we could simply think of a solution where we ban the use of uh, antibiotics for animal growth promotion. Or you can formulate this actually in, in another way, no, not, in an, in an, not formulate, another option would be to ban all uses of antibiotics that are not under the super, supervision of a veterinarian. And both of these policies have been implemented in, in, different, country, in different countries in, the, in, in Europe. For example, in Sweden, in Denmark, and uh, the Netherlands. Now, banning has a number of very clear and simple advantages. By banning, we sort of know the effect. By saying you are not allowed to use antibiotics for this purpose anymore, as long as people follow the rules, they will stop taking, using antibiotics for that purpose. And we know if we looked at studies, we know that if we introduce that type of ban, it will reduce the use of antibiotics, and it will slow the development of antibiotic resistance. The problem with this type of policies is that it's the strength that is very crude is also the cost. It's usually very costly from the farm level point of view to have a very simple rule that says you're not allowed to use this at all. So these policies are usually very costly. It usually affects the effectiveness of our agriculture. Uh, and it usually also means that we would have to spend more money on, on infection control. And if, I think if you think about sort of a modern agriculture with the animals living very tight together, you can see why, why people would like to use antibiotics, right? So an alternative to this, would be to have what I call a user fee instead. And for now, a user fee for non-human use, okay? We could talk about the user fee for human use as well. But, but what has been discussed in the literature is a user fee for non-human use. So what do I mean by that? Well, I basically mean that we would tax antibiotics. We would increase the cost of antibiotics for non-human use. This is an economic incentive. By increasing the price of antibiotics, we will have a reduced use of antibiotics. And by the reduced use of antibiotics, we would have reduced uh, uh, development of, of antibiotic resistance. 
Now, the advantage of a user fee or a tax compared to a ban is that you let people themselves decide whether it's worth it or not. This is what I mean by sort of the, the second point here, that a user fee targets the low value users and the high value users, users that think this is still worthwhile, can pay the user fee and use the antibiotics. So you can sort of better sort the value of the use of the drug. And usually what you also, that means is that you really don't have to control the use. Just as long as you have an efficient tax system, you don't have to control and see what people are doing or not. It will be less costly. However, compared to a ban, the problem with the use of fee or a tax is that we don't really know the effect beforehand. We don't know the, the level of reduction of the use of antibiotics if we introduce a use of fee. And this is a classical problem in, in any, any type of environmental policy. With the ban, we know the effect, but it's usually very costly. With the tax, we don't know the effect, but it's usually much more cost efficient compared to that. <laughs> now I'm going to move to the doctors. So now I want to think about policies to affect doctors. And believe me, affecting doctors is not easy. <laughs> I can assure you. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to give you an example. I want to give you this example, maybe not because it's the most efficient way, but it's an illustration of a completely different way of thinking. And it's about thinking about the decision environment. And some of you might have heard the word nudge, which is, which is essentially what I mean, that we affect the decision environment. So with the nudge, I mean that we make a very small change in the, in the decision environment, in order to affect people to act in a way that we think is better. We don't ban, we don't affect the economic in incentives, we just simply change the decision environment a little bit. Let me illustrate this with two examples when it comes to doctors. This is a study where <coughs> doctors prescription behavior were screened. And doctors' prescription behavior were evaluated by external people. And they were told how good or how bad, depending on uh, where you are on the scale, they were compared to their peers. Okay? So doctors were being told, you are really good at prescribing antibiotics. Or they were being told, you're not as good in prescribing antibiotics as your colleagues. And the idea here is, well, there are several ideas. But before I talk about the ideas, let me just be clear. We haven't changed the economic incentives at all. We haven't forbidden anything. We're just telling doctors how they are behaving compared to their peers, their colleagues. And the idea of this is, well, it's several. One is, of course, obvious. One is, right, it's pure information, right? I'm being told if I'm doing the, uh, how, how am I doing compared to others. It's pure information. I don't think that's what's going on here to any large extent. I think to a much larger extent, it is peer comparison. I'm being told how I am behaving compared to my peers, to my colleagues. Am I a good doctor or am I a bad doctor? And what I found in this particular study, so let, no, let, let me, maybe not all of you can see, see this le uh, letter here. So, so the way it worked here was that the doctors got emails. I think it was weekly, I'm not sure, maybe it was bi-weekly, but at regular points in time, they got emails. And these emails told the doctors how they were, before, uh, how they were performing. And in this particular case, and I'll, I'm going to read this out because there are some, some important things here, here to say, the email reads, you are not a top performer. Okay? So obviously we understand there were top performers. That's the first thing you're being told. And you're being told that you're not the top performer. You are writing too many unnecessary prescriptions. 
Based on your most recent activity, you wrote 12 prescriptions out of 24 acute respiratory infection cases that did not warrant antibiotics. To improve your behavior, please see these guidelines. So it's a lot of information on what to behave, but I think the most important part here is that they're being told that some other people are much better than what they are. And of course, to be clear, some people that were good, they got a much more positive email, right? You are a top performer. You're behaving very well. So by doing this, what they found was that uh, uh, prescription of antibiotics reduced by, by, what was it, 16 percentage points. I mind you, these are doctors, as I said from the beginning. These are not people that you easily affect. But just by providing this information, you reduced uh, uh, prescription of antibiotics by 16 percentage points. Now, what I always like to point out when I see these studies is we actually don't know for sure what prescriptions that were cut. We can't say that this was 16 percentage better, right? Because maybe there were some necessary prescriptions that were cut. So all we know sort of is that prescription went down. The other way, and this is the same study, instead of just comparing with others, just basically asking doctors to, in the form that in this particular case played no role whatsoever, they just had to write down and justify why they were prescribing antibiotics. So to be clear, this is, this is not that, 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 uh, uh, that uh, uh, someone was checking this and saying yes and no, it's just that they needed to justify their behavior. And this would go on, on the patient's made medical record. Prescription went down by 18 percentage points, so very similar to, to the first case. <laughs> so I think it, it, it is actually, it is possible to affect how doctors uh, behave as well, uh, even if it might be a little bit more difficult. I heard during the break that you had talked a lot about drug development. I'm not going to talk that much about drug development. But I just want to point out something that, that sometimes raises a lot of objections. I just want to point out uh, uh, some good aspects. And that is the role of patents. So with the patent, pharmaceutical companies get basically a monopoly right for a drug for a certain period of time. Uh, and for people outside the field and for people that are not economists, this seems like a crazy idea. Because basically what this will mean is that there will be very high prices of drugs because pharmaceuticals have, have a monopoly power. However, one must always remember the reason for why we have a patent system. And that is that there are big benefits of having a patent system because it creates incentives for developing new drugs. Developing new drugs is very expensive. If pharmaceutical companies did not know that they could make a lot of money after they have developed a successful drug, they would not have invested these monies in developing drugs. So a patent system is a very important part of development of drugs. Now, I'm not saying that pharmaceutical companies are angels that are always doing the right thing and have always have the right prices. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that a patent system that gives them a period of time to make monopoly profit is most likely necessary, in, 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 at least in the, in the free market economy. Obviously, the cost of having a patent is that it will have a high cost for the buyers. They will have a higher price than if there was a competition. However, in the case of antibiotics, this might not be as bad as, as for other drugs. Because in the case of antibiotics, we actually want to limit the use. So, so the high price of, of, of new antibiotics might not be as bad as if we compare with other policies. So, so my, 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 my gut solution to that would be not to screw up the patent system, 
that have the patent system and then use the same way of supporting poor countries as we do in other circumstances. That would mean subsidizing the drugs in, in, in that setting, not sort of affect the patent system because of that, but instead support the use of drugs there. Sort of separate those two things.